you tell us about your short film, Woodman? Uh, it's uh, essentially, um, I would say, it's, uh, what if Pinocchio never turned into a real boy? What if he just grew up to be a wooden man who lies? Hmm. And, uh, and, you know, we went from there. And it's been rather successful, too, hasn't it? Yeah, it's played almost 35 festivals um, and uh, won numerous awards. It took a jury prize and uh, an audience choice at uh, Sonoma Fest, I think, and just won a, a Leo Award in BC for Best Makeup and keeps on tracking. Mm -hmm. That's not all. So I've lost track of so many. Well, congratulations on all your success with it. <laughs> Were you aware of the fandom when you got the job? Not to the extent that I obviously know of it now. I was aware of it. I had heard the term Brony and I didn't really know too much about it. Uh, I knew of the show and its success, how many seasons they'd had. Um, and I was warned by the staff, the directors and the writers. They, they so when I first did my first episode, they sort of said like, well, you know, this is a big deal, right? Like you're gonna get, like people are gonna tweet you and you might go to conventions and things. And I was like, okay, sure, whatever. Cause that was a whole new concept to me. Uh, and then I started to learn about it and boom, big time. Yeah, like it was huge and uh, overwhelming, but in a really good way, mm -hmm. yeah. What can you tell us about your Patreon? Oh, um, I'm just trying to generate more money to uh, fund future projects at this point. We, um, we're trying to collect some money to, to get Woodman out to festivals, and that's been great. So if anyone wants to come and join my Patreon and help me to generate money for my next project, which is a... a <laughs> Basically, it's Shaun of the Dead meets Trekkies. It's a, it's a, it's a feature-length zombie comedy set at a brownie convention. Oh my god. Yeah, and I've already written the script, and uh, so I'm trying to generate funding now. That's my next step, is to try and get funding so we can shoot the dang thing. And, uh, so that's what the money is going to through the Patreon right now, if you want to go to the Patreon. And I'll take pledges. <laughs> but, um, yeah. How hard is it to dub anime? Uh, so when you record anime, as I'm sure you have as well, yep. yes, oh, Peter has as well, but, yeah. but um, as Peter will know, uh, when you record anime, you practically never are in the room with anybody else. Uh, it's all uh, ADR, so uh, additional uh, dialogue replacement or additional dialogue replacement? Additional, uh, automatic dialogue replacement or additional, or additional dialogue recording, depending on what project. Right, so what happens is, is that the animation is done at that stage. It was done in Japan and it was recorded for uh, uh, Japanese timing and then what happens is is that you have to come to it with a translated script and uh, time notes uh, on when you can talk and what you need to say and how quickly you need to say it so there are definite challenges you don't get to um, I often get chastised by the directors of anime when I'm on it they just go like you don't have time to act like you don't have time to act in this so just just say it say it in two seconds say that whole sentence in two seconds whereas even in con uh, conventional um, prelay animation, so like Western animation, you also don't often have time to act because it's you know it's got to be fast paced. But you do have a little more room that you can play with the intent and the you know the, the how long you take to say something. Um, whereas with anime, it is uh, it is completely pre prescribed. So you get three beeps in your ear, and then on the fourth imaginary beat, you go, and they'll tell you like. Oh, okay, that was, you, you were way over, uh, can you half that? And you have to try to do it again without rushing. So sometimes when you will watch a dubbed anime movie or series, and you will hear the dubbed version, like, rush through, uh, be slightly kinder on them, because they may have been told in the studio, okay, in Japanese this only took a second and a half, and was very complicated, uh, now you've got to do that in English in that same amount of time, except it's three sentences. Do they, I mean... You know, the, it's saying essentially the same thing in a different way. Like I think as an actor, you're always approaching a scene, and so as an actor approaching a scene, you're always saying, "Okay, uh, what's true for my character? What does my character want? Um, what what way is my character? What tactic is my character using in order to accomplish this goal? What are they trying to get out of the other player in the scene? And um, and how do I ground that in my own reality? You know, so you're asking yourself these kinds of questions as you approach the material. So when you go into a prelay session, you've read the script and you've kind of asked these questions of yourself and you've come to some conclusions about the way that you're going to do it and you kind of attack it. 
and away you go, and you kind of do it your way, and then they give you notes and you get directed. You still have to kind of go through that same process of decision making. You still have to create a character, and you still have to make the choices, and then you get. And you have to say, like, I've come to the station to, you know, to meet my wife of five years, who I have not seen in, since birth, and we are lonely. <laughs> you know, a lot of the times, uh, you know, if you have a, an understanding and a, and a flexible director, they will actually sort of say, you know what, let's rewrite this ourselves right now, and then we'll send it off, and if the clients, you know, are really strict and want it exactly like the book, then they'll come back and you'll do some, some pickups and things like that. But a lot of the time, it will, like, you'll have a director who will be like, okay, I understand, there is no way you can do this. Like we have, you have been asked too much by the translators yeah. of this text, so we'll cut it down and try to keep the same intent as we yeah. were saying. So yeah. you'll you'll have to take that performance, the intent, you know, like how you would give it, you know, the gravity that it requires, but all really compressed. Yeah. And so that's why, yes, uh, you know, when I hear people, uh, you know, when they really want to attack English dubs of uh, of anime, um, I, I have a, a very different perspective on just like you know, I'll I'll, I'll see a dub and I'll just be like, you know what, they did the best. With what <laughs> They, they did, they did they so did the good. Best with what they, they did had. so good. Yeah. It's terrible, but they did. Really yeah, yeah. You go like that wasn't great, but uh, you know what? They said all the words and they got it in in two seconds. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah. Well, and you'll usually do your instinct because you know through training and experience you'll have your instinct the way you want to say it, and you'll do that. And the director will be like, "Not no." Like, uh, and then could you shave off a second or two? So yeah, there's a lot of those uh, those differences that you deal with, and. Um, do the best you can. What do you do with your Twitch stream? <laughs> oh, with my Twitch stream. Uh, so I play video games on there. I love video games. And um, I really love to have an, an interactive stream. So I knew when I started doing it that there are people who stream on Twitch who are very good at games. And then there are people who are entertaining. And I knew that I was going to have to be on one end of the spectrum than the other. Uh, because I am definitely not that great at most games I play, <laughs> but I sure do have fun. Um, so I try to have an interactive stream and have fun with people, and um, it began just out of um, just a period of inactivity in my professional work and uh, sort of feeling the need to find another avenue to perform. Uh, to sort of, you know, keep myself, you know, from getting rusty or, you know, too isolated from performance because that, that's, that's, it's not quite death, but it's really, really bad for a performer if you just sort of go a really long time without either taking classes or uh, performing in a, you know, a group of people or performing in general, uh, you start losing touch with the things that you need to do. And so I thought, you know what, uh, a lot of the time that I'm spending sitting on my butt uh, <laughs> is playing video games and I can do that and also entertain people at the same time so I decided to experiment with it. Didn't you actually do a charity stream? I've done a few charities, yeah. Um, I've done a, a couple of charity streams. One of them, um, the, the biggest one I've done was for uh, Girl Anna. Yes, um, so, I saw on your Twitter. <laughs> yeah, so on my Twitter and on my on my YouTube, um, uh, it, it's it's a long story, but essentially what happened was is that a, a friend of mine had a friend with a daughter who was being uh, bullied because she liked My Little Pony, and she told me about this because my friend knows I'm I'm in the show, and. Um, I thought that this was like terror. I thought this was terrible, and it really made me sad because it reminded me of when I was a kid and the things that I was into and to be bullied for. And I realized that for the first time in my career, in my adult life, I might be able to actually do something because I know people who are in the show, or I know you know showrunners, and I was starting to get booked at conventions and things like that. At the very least, I might be able to just sort of do something show related and maybe put the word out for people to like just you know say a little something in a Twitter uh, feed. That was it. I, I originally thought if I can just get a few people to reply and say like you know you know don't worry like look at all these other fans because they lived in a in a pretty uh, like isolated area of the mm. country and um, maybe she hadn't been exposed to the fandom or knew that the fandom existed. Yeah. So that began as a tweet which then picked up a lot of traction and then I started getting contacted by some of the convention organizers and they said where does this girl live and is it possible that they would want to go to a convention 
so then, you know, discussions and stuff happened, found out that, you know, like, her favourite pony is Sakura, and Brenda was going to be at Everfree, and the Everfree people had reached out, and so I sort of played the, the go-between, and put people in touch with each other, and then eventually we basically got it to where they had been confirmed that the, the convention would uh, pay to bring the family to Everfree. Um, uh-huh. And so what I did was try to get uh, a charity stream going to help cover some of the cost of things like VIP badge, uh, ability, you know, the uh, sit-down dinner with Brenda, uh, and all sorts of stuff like that. And That's you know, sweet. And it was, it was amazing. I just... Just the, and the fandom did what the, I've seen the fandom do many, many times, where it just embraced somebody and stepped up, and yeah. it was it was it was amazing to see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm glad that I was able to help somehow. Like I was able to sort of put it in motion. And I'm really, I'm really glad that, that you did that. Because for me, I've been on every season of the show, and and we sort of had our arc of coming into contact with the Burning community and sort of being amazed by the generosity and the support of it. And, uh, and it's nice to see that the people that are sort of more recent casts are getting involved in the same way and the community is still rising to that. You know, because I, I just think it's a, an amazing thing. It's easy to take for granted. It's easy to forget. This community is so remarkable and so generous. That yeah, and you were even in uh, uh, John Delancey's uh, Brony documentary, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. yeah, and when was that? 2012. Right, so 2012, so exactly, like, you know, seeing something like that and then, uh, like, knowing that about the community and then uh, when I started to, to put all of that into motion and then seeing it once again step up and just huge amounts of generosity from both individuals and groups, uh, just making it all come together. So, like, the convention itself and then fans and then fans of mine and then just just people who had never really interacted with me but heard about it through other people uh, all got together and uh, and made it happen as a group and it was just yeah that that is probably the most overwhelming thing about the fandom that I've that I've seen mm-hmm. like you know the the generosity and the and the kindness that I've seen but then that being sort of focused into doing such a good thing um, like I've seen the charity auctions and things like that and it, it sounds bad but you can sometimes feel a little detached from you know, like you see the charity auction, you hear about the amazing generosity and the money that gets raised for the charities. But this was like a, a singular case where I like I saw this young girl and you know what it meant to her and to her father who was there who was helping her like go to the convention. And you know she wrote me uh, like a, a heartfelt thank you note Aww. and things like that. So it was like it was right there. Like I saw it. It was in front of me and. Yeah, it was really, it was personal and it was, uh, it was amazing. Essentially, you led this charge. It, uh, you kind of got the, the ball going on this like one. The call out and, um, and the fandom answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you prepare Bill for this community? There's not, there's not really an opportunity for, like, there's, there's no avenue for us to kind of take someone aside and go, hey, so look, you're going to be involved in this community. This is part of this is a bigger thing than you know. That avenue just isn't really there. But Bill took the initiative uh, when he was invited to his first convention that he texted me and said, you know, listen, can I pick your brain and, and just, like ask you what to expect of these kinds of things? And uh, so he came over and we had a couple of drinks and a great old time and we talked about what it, you know, the positives of it, certainly, but also the negatives of it because it, it does come with a certain amount of politics and, uh, and you know, there is kind of a downside right now. Uh, well, and also, sometimes and also that, like, uh, that you can avoid if you are if you're careful if you choose to be not involved with the, the politics of it, you can not be involved and that's great and because I think, then you just have the joy and I think also just uh, the unavoidable side of uh, like it being an exhausting experience sure, yeah, you know like is. I had never been to a convention except as a guest uh, as a guest like sorry as an attendee so I'd gone to some conventions like fan conventions like fan expo uh, in Vancouver and things like that, and but that's a very much a like, oh, I'll go for a couple of hours and then I'll do a couple of laps at the hall and then I'll go home. But coming as a guest, it was a whole other experience and it was really good to be prepared for that because uh, there's a sort of a physical and a, like, a, like, a, like a mental drain of energy that uh, comes with conventions. And so being ready to know that that was coming 
was hugely helpful because mm -hmm. otherwise I probably wouldn't have recognized, you know, why do I feel like you're know, just so wrecked? Am I getting sick? Like, what is happening? Um, and they were, you know, Concrud is real. But <laughs> also just like Con Crash as well. And that was another thing that I did not know about and, you know, sort of being pre warned about, you yeah. know, just convention in general was that yeah, there will be like there'll be a calm down, like this is what to expect. And um, I've I've since I've since taken up the uh, the, the the gauntlet or the mantle to uh, a couple of newer people to uh, yeah. My Little Pony. Um, yeah. I sat down and had a chat with them. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and I was just like, oh, I can tell you all about it. Yeah, I can tell you all about it. These are all original ideas that I had. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be, I did I did note check you almost the entire time. I was just like, okay, so what Peter told me was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I had experienced post conflict pressure days. Oh yeah, that's yeah. terrible. Yeah, and you just just to share you can with all your friends, yep. and then you get home and there's uh -huh. this fight. Oh yeah. yeah, it's it's just like oh oh real life. Yeah, and, and then couple that, that it's coming. Couple that with being the center of attention, at right. time, which especially at the beginning of it of this experience, uh, we really were like it really felt for me in, in 2012, 2013. It really felt for me like I was a movie star on those weekends. It really felt like I was this. Genuine celebrity, uh, and uh, and to come home from that and have the silence, as you say, and I was so ready to be on all the time. Like I would walk, I would go to the grocery store to buy toilet paper, and I'd be like, I'd be walking down the toilet paper aisle with the toilet paper under my arm. People would be coming the other way, and I'd look at them like they were supposed to recognize me. Like, hey, <laughs> oh, yeah, you're strangers. To, yeah, they're supposed to give you like a little smile and just go like, Hey, how you doing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can see. Oh, yeah, so I'm not famous here at the toilet paper aisle. Has anything surprised you at these pony cons? Not really surprised me. Um, no, I feel the man. Yeah, like, like no, I was gonna say, like, like, no, Peter, Peter really, like, laid the groundwork to be like, you know, this might happen, this might happen, this might happen. Some of it's happened, some of it hasn't, and uh, I was ready for almost all of it. Nothing really surprised me. There were just, uh, like, suddenly, there are, there are always gonna be things that you can only ever uh, learn from experiencing. And there were a couple of those where I was just like, oh, okay. Okay, like I like that makes sense to me now in my head as opposed to like you can't really tell somebody that it's like Unfortunately, my parents have tried to teach me so many lessons over the years And then I'll make that exact mistake and be like, oh now I get it <laughs> So there are a couple of things where I was just like, I'll be fine. I'm just Like water off my back or that's not gonna happen to me and then like I would experience it and go like oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you part of a web series now? Yeah, so I'm involved in a web series called The Dangers of Online Dating. There's two seasons out there. I play a medical health doctor named Dr. Cameron. And there's a spin-off series called Sex with Paula. Yeah. Where uh, the main character, Paula, who is also a sex health nurse, um, talks directly to Cameron and gives sex health advice. And they decided that Dr. Cameron should do a couple of those ones as well. So I've done three of those. So they're, they're called Sex with Paula with Dr. Cameron. <laughs> Yeah, I personally like those because I enjoy how animated you get. You're not a stiff. You're actually moving your arms around. You're making little hand gestures. Yeah, they look at myself a little yeah. bit more, which is nice. But that's a fun series to do. I just finished, um, I just did a day on another web series called Narcoleap, which has just been completed. And um, yeah, so there's a few. Is there much of a difference between doing a web and a cartoon series? Well, I mean, doing a web series is more like shooting a film or shooting a TV show, right? So it's more, obviously, it's on, on camera. Um, so there's that difference. And I mean, doing a cartoon series is like, uh, I think I'm allowed to say this now that I'm, I'm also in the new Mega Man, um, which is great fun. But like, doing, thank you. But doing, a, but doing that is that, uh, you know, you show up and you, you bang out an 11 minute episode in an hour and you go home. And even though you, like, I might be the guest guy in that episode, um, it takes an hour to do it and have to go. Whereas in Narcoleague, for instance, I have two lines and it took all day. Wow. Right? It takes 12 hours to shoot a day of footage. And they make you earn it on a TV or a sure. or a film. Sure, like my um, my Scooby Natural episode where, you know, I have one scene at the beginning and one scene at the end. I was two days on set. Scooby-Doo Scooby 2, which I mean even less, <laughs> um, was four days on set. Whoa. Right? And that's their long days. Yeah, like Thank you.
Yeah, 10 seconds of, of on screen will be 12 hours. Oh, at least. Yeah, of 12 hours of action. Yeah, at least. Whereas, you know, 11 whole minutes will be an hour. Yeah. Compress it down, just go like, all right, we knocked out two episodes and it's barely lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>